Father, we thank you again for your blessing that you share upon us so often. Thank you for the privilege of Christian fellowship. And we thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. And Lord, it's a glorious passage and we pray that you would speak to us. Open our eyes that we would indeed see wonderful things in your law. And we pray that you would anoint my lips by your Holy Spirit, anoint our ears and our hearts, our minds, that we would be warmed and thrilled to learn of your word. And so uh, we pray we would draw closer to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you've followed me thus far in the last few sessions, uh, we have seen Jesus work some amazing miracles as he's made his way to Jerusalem, knowing that he would there be crucified. And in our study today, Jesus has reached the city. And we start in Mark chapter 11. If you've got your Bibles handy, that would be great. And we here read of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And we have the entry to that, or the introduction to that rather, in verses 1 to 3. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please, Matt. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. And he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. And this begins the fifth major section of Mark's Gospel, and it centres around Jesus' ministry in and around Jerusalem during his last week before being crucified. Bethany was about two miles outside Jerusalem, and the name means house of dates or figs. Well, Bethphage is less, is less than a mile southeast of the city on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives. And that, the name of, of Bethphage is House of Unripe Figs. So we've got a house of dates or figs and a house of unripe figs. And I think there's something of an irony about that, given that Jesus would curse a fig tree that had no figs during the course of that week. And we'll be looking at that later. Uh, in a clear reference to the spiritual barrenness of Israel. And the citizens of these two towns uh, were noted for being hospitable to pilgrims who went to Jerusalem to celebrate the biblical feasts. Uh, from Bethphage, which had an elevated position on the slopes of the mount, there's a breathtaking view of Jerusalem. And according to rabbinical tradition, as they discuss the significance of Bethphage, uh, it is stated that the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem from the city limits of the eastern side of the city. And that's, of course, exactly what Jesus did. And the Mishnah, which is a collection of Jewish writings, concludes that the city limits on the eastern side of Jerusalem was the small town of Bethphage. And I think we should remember, sort of as we prepare for the main passage today, that, that Jerusalem during Passover was buzzing with visitors and excitement because of the festival. The population of the city tripled over the feast time and the Romans were on high alert in case there was a riot or any other sort of disturbance. And it was into this context that Jesus came, riding on a donkey, acclaimed by the gathered crowds. Uh, the date in the Jewish calendar was the 10th of Nisan, uh, the day when the Passover lambs were set aside. And over the next four days, the lambs would be, would be examined for any blemish or defect that might make them unsuitable for sacrifice. And of course, Jesus, as the true Passover lamb, was set aside in the city on that day. And we will see that over the following four days, he was examined by the various groups of Jews to try to find fault with him, but hallelujah, no faults were found. And we read in verse 2 that Jesus sent two of his disciples into the village to obtain a colt that had never been ridden. Matthew mentions the mother donkey being there too in his account. <coughs> and Jesus told the disciples in verse 3 that if anyone asked what they were doing, they were to say that the Lord had need of it. If Jesus was speaking Aramaic, which is quite possible, 
then the that uh, phrase or uh, sentence could be translated as Yahweh has need of it. And uh, that sort of confirms Jesus' deity as the one who needed it. It just sort of lifts it up that bit higher, doesn't it? And there was an interesting custom of the day that allowed a major religious figure or political figure to seize a donkey or mule for his own use. He could just turn up at a place and say, I want that animal. And if he was an important enough figure, they would say, okay, you can have it. And that could explain why the request was not questioned by the owners of the cult. Uh, or it could be that God had prepared the hearts of these people. Uh, some reckon that there was some prearranged uh, deal for him to borrow it. I, I, I don't go with that one personally. I, th I think uh, it's one of those first two that, that God prepared the hearts or it was just part of that custom of the day that, that they could just say, the Lord had, has need of this and he would release it. And um, in entering the city, using this animal, Jesus was fulfilling Zechariah 9, verse 9, which hopefully will bring another slide, just to have that verse. Great, thank you. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He's just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. And Jesus fulfilled that prophecy that was written hundreds of years before. And he deliberately chose a young donkey, not a stallion, not a horse, not even coming on foot. And that's because in that day to come riding a colt or a donkey as opposed to a mighty war horse was to come as a man of peace. And the purpose of Jesus' first coming, and particularly this visit to Jerusalem, was for Jesus to die so that he could make available peace with God for mankind. And when Jesus returns at his second coming, we know he will be mounted on a white horse, the animal of war and victory. And he will defeat his enemies very decisively at his return. And although Zechariah foretold that the Messiah's coming would be lowly, this an entry on uh, Palm Sunday, as we know it, was also triumphant as Jesus came as King and Messiah. But sadly, the Jewish leaders had rejected him as such around a year and a half before. And Jesus was not here giving another opportunity to the nation because nationally they had rejected him and their judgment would come in 70 AD. But he was still the true Messiah. He was still the true King of the Jews and by entering the city on a donkey, as Zechariah had foretold, he was affirming his messianic credentials. And Mark's account of the event continues in verses 4 to 7. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. <coughs> Jesus' prediction proved true, as the colt was found exactly as Jesus had said, and the untying of the animal by the disciples was queried, and as predicted, the owners released the colt for Jesus to use. And a cult that had not previously been ridden might normally be expected to buck and to try and throw off its rider, especially given the fact there were, there were crowds, there was noise as well. But of course, Jesus, as the creator of the universe, the creator of the donkey, had total control over the animal. It just shows his supremacy over nature, over his creation. And after all, Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he brought peace to that animal. And all Jesus had on the colt was a makeshift saddle of some clothes from the disciples. But despite that, the, the colt was peaceful and controlled as Jesus rode on him. And then we find the entry into the city in verses 8 to 11. If I could have the next slide, thank you. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. <coughs> 
Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of, our Lord, of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. When welcoming a king in those days, it was customary for people to lay their outer garments on the road and then add festal branches. And this is what was happening as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Given the limited amount of clothes that the people would have had in those days, to throw your garment on the road was a costly sacrifice of praise. We tend to have many more clothes than these days. But is our praise to God as costly as theirs was? And palm branches had the distinct meaning for the Jews in that day, uh, for it was sim a symbol of national liberation. So with that in mind, those in the crowd laying down palm branches were indicating their desire for the Messiah to liberate them from Gentile rule, which of course was the Roman government. And despite having been rejected by the Jewish leaders, Jesus still presented himself as their king, even though he knew that he'd come to die within a few days. And as their king, he was rejected, but he will return, this time on a white horse, speaking of victory in battle, and he will then be accepted as the king of the Jews. The people also cried out, Hosanna, which means save now. However, the cry was more than Hosanna, but Hosanna in the highest. And that adds the sense of save us, O God, who lives in the heavens. And uh, they were calling out to their Messiah King, adding the sense of deity there, whether they fully realised it or not. But it does seem that they expected Jesus as Messiah to take up his throne and deliver them from the Romans and then set up his kingdom. But that was not why Jesus rode into the city that day. He had to deal with the crucial issue of man's salvation first. And then the people also cried out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a quote from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. If I could have the next slide, please. And that says, save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a messianic psalm, looking forward to the coming of Israel's Messiah. <coughs> and on this occasion, the praise to Jesus was based on scripture. And when we praise God, it's important that our praise and our worship is rooted in Scripture. When we praise God as he tells us to, then he's glorified and we are blessed. When a Roman gen general had achieved a great victory, he was welcomed back into Rome with a great parade known as the Roman Triumph. But to earn that victory that he'd won, he had to have claimed the lives of at least 5,000 enemy soldiers. And as Jesus entered Jerusalem, he had not had that type of victory. But within a few weeks, he would have conquered the hearts of over 5,000 people through the preaching of the apostles. And when he returns to earth, he will deal with many more than 5,000 of his enemies very decisively with just the word of his mouth. Hallelujah. And rather than coming as a conquering king, Jesus came into Jerusalem to die as the suffering servant. He fulfilled the requirements of the feast of Passover completely, dying for us as the true Passover lamb. In the time of Jesus, the high priest, on the 10th of Nisan, the very day that Jesus entered the city, he would go to Bethany to get an unblemished lamb and bring it into the temple to be inspected for four days. And as the lamb was brought into the, to the eastern gate, pilgrims would line the route, wave palm branches and call out the same quote from Psalm 118, verse 26, we got there. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the purpose of that celebration was to set aside the Passover lamb so that it could be checked for blemishes in readiness for the Passover sacrifice. And Jesus came from the home of Lazarus in Bethany that day as the Passover lamb. And Mark records in verse 11 that as Jesus entered the city, 
he went into the temple, just as the lamb would have gone into the temple. And over the next four days, he taught in the temple, he was questioned, he was inspected, if you like, by the religious leaders, and no fault or blemish in him could be found. He truly is God's Passover lamb. And how, but when Jesus entered the temple, he was inspecting the proceedings going on there, and he was not pleased. And that prompted his actions the next day. But verse 11 tells us it was getting late, so he set off for Bethany again with his disciples. And then the next day we have, in verses 12 to 14, we have Jesus returning the next day to Jerusalem, and on the way he cursed a fig tree. Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now, at first glance, it's very easy to think that Jesus was having a bad, a bad day, as it seems somewhat harsh for him to do this to the tree. The tree hadn't done anything wrong. <coughs> um, and the fact that Jesus, sorry, the fact that Mark records that Jesus was hungry reminds us that Jesus is fully human as well as divine. And although we read it was not the season for figs, it is normal in Israel that when fig trees are in leaf, there are edible knobs or nodules. And there's a biblical reference to this in the Song of Solomon. If I could have the next uh, slide, please. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 13, which says, The fig tree puts forth her green figs, and the vines with tender grapes give a good smell. <coughs> and then we've got green figs mentioned there. And if the tree had none of these edible buds around Passover, it was a sign that it would not bear any fruit that year. And these buds would drop off when the normal crop of figs formed and ripened in late May or June. So it was reasonable for Jesus to expect to find something to eat from the tree on his way into the city. And the presence of the leaves, if you like, was the profession that the tree had something, figs, that it didn't have. And in view of that, Jesus said, let no one eat from you ever again. And this incident was a symbolic act by Jesus on the dry, fruitless spiritual condition of Israel. We could say that it was an acted out parable. There was a good deal of religious activity in the nation. The religious leaders were indeed very religious, but they had firmly rejected Jesus as their Messiah a year and a half before despite the very clear evidence that Jesus was indeed the one long promised in so many scriptures. And it was not a case of Jesus being grumpy that day, but with the fig tree being a symbol of Israel, he was pronouncing a judgment on the nation that it was and would be fruitless. He was putting them on notice that judgment was coming. And we know with history that it fell on Jerusalem in 70 AD. In this parabolic act, Jesus was denouncing the pretense of fruit by Israel when in fact there was none. And the nation was spiritually barren despite God's love for them, despite his covenants with them, and despite his continued, continued mercy towards them. And Jesus' reference to forever, when he says you do not produce fruit forever, doesn't mean that God has cast away Israel for all time because the Greek word used means that this curse would be for an age. And we know that the Bible promises restoration for Israel in the latter days, when the nation will again be fruitful. And interestingly, this is the only miracle recorded by Mark that was destructive in nature, which adds force to the message behind it. God is infinitely patient, but that doesn't mean that he, that, uh, he can or will put off judgment on the wicked forever. When the time for judgment comes, it's not because God's run out of patience, but because he knows that the time for judgment is right in his eternal purposes. And we'll see more of this fig tree incident when Jesus returned to the city the following day. But for now, let's note in verse 14 that Mark records that the disciples heard what Jesus said about the tree. So it sets the scene for the time when the tree was withered. And that leads us on then 
to Jesus coming into Jerusalem, having cursed the fig tree, which you read about in verses 15 to 19. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves? <coughs> and the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Um, yeah, out of the city. Jesus had previously cleansed the temple at another Passover at the beginning of his public ministry. We see that in John chapter 2, 13 to 16. But as the Messiah and the Son of God, he is the owner of the temple. So he's entitled to put it right when it's necessary. And the word used for drive out is literally to throw out. It involves force. And sadly, the results of Jesus' previous cleansing of the temple were temporary and the wrong practices of the Jewish leaders had crept back into the life of the temple. The high priest had authorised a market for the sale of ritually pure items necessary for the temple sacrifices, including wine, oil, salt, approved animals and birds. And these had to be paid for using temple coinage, which had to be exchanged by the priests and those working for them, of course, at a profit. And sometimes a degree of extortion took place, making a mockery of the true purpose of the temple, that there should be free access for worship for all. And this reminds us that we must always remain on our toes to ensure that we don't allow anything unclean into our midst as Christians, that we never compromise with shady dealing or do anything that would dishonour God in our worship or in the way that we live. And Jesus used much the same tactics to cleanse the temple as he had done the first time. Although that first time we read that he made a whip out of cords and used that to drive out the traders. This time there was a difference in that Mark tells us in verse 16, and he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. And this whole event took place in the court of the Gentiles, the only area where Gentiles could uh, come in the temple. And it seems that the area had become something of a thoroughfare as people took shortcuts through the temple area to carry their merchandise. And in verse 17, Jesus said that the temple was to be a house of prayer for all nations. In saying that, he was drawing from Isaiah 56, uh, 7b, if I could have the next slide, please. Which it reads, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And that reflects God's heart for a relationship with all humanity, not just Israel. But one of the role, roles that Israel had was to be a good missionary witness to the rest of the nations. But those Gentiles who came to the temple area would see this profiteering in the only place where they were allowed to worship and would have been put off the message of salvation from God. And in the second part of what Jesus said in verse 17, Jesus drew from Jeremiah 7 verse 11, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. A den of thieves is a place where thieves associate and hide. It's a very sad situation when the house of God becomes a place where unrepentant and active sinners can associate and hide. Those who should have been leading the people to worship true God in purity and humility were charging excessive prices for the sacrificial animals and for the correct currency with which to pay the temple tax. Every Jewish male was required to pay the tax, equivalent to about two days pay, but no doubt it cost more to pay it in the required currency. And we find the response of the scribes and chief priests to this cleansing of the temple in verse 18. <coughs> And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. The one who was the promised Messiah, the Son of God, who did nothing wrong, who cared for the people as a shepherd for his sheep when, they didn't, when these other leaders didn't, was objectionable to them. 
The heart that is hardened, the mind that is closed to God, will not be open to the truth that is found in Jesus and displayed in God's word, including the Old Testament that these religious people claimed to love so much. They wanted Jesus dead, but they feared him, mindful that the people were astonished at his teaching. His words had divine authority that their teaching did not. The challenge that they faced was that the city would be overflowing with visitors, pilgrims who had come to celebrate the Passover, and the Romans were on high alert in case there was any uprising of the people. They could take no action that day, and Jesus left the city in the evening and returned to Bethany. The next morning, the disciples saw that the curse that Jesus had pronounced on the fig tree had happened. Uh, verses 20 to 24. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will hear, have them. This was when the lesson of the fig tree was to be learnt by the disciples. Peter noticed what had happened to the fig tree, and pointed it out in verse 21. The lesson that Jesus gives is on the topic of prayer in uh, verses 22 and onwards. He told them to have faith in God. True faith must be placed in something or someone. Uh, it's, it's never in a vacuum. We are told elsewhere that our prayers must be according to the will of God. So we are not to be selfish when we pray. God will not be persuaded to act against his nature or his will by someone praying selfishly which is one reason why we need the Holy Spirit's help when we do pray. And we should also bear in mind that the Jews referred to their greatest teachers as removers of mountains, because they solved problems of the Mosaic law. So it was said that they uprooted mountains, so that would give you a Jewish background to what Jesus was saying. And in Jewish imagery, a mountain signifies something strong and immovable, a problem that stands in the way. And that adds more meaning to what Jesus said. And the more we understand the character of God, the more likely it is that we will pray according to his will and then see answers to our prayers and their problems removed. And finally, the second lesson that Jesus brought from this uh, incident is in verses 25 to 26. <coughs> and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. God will not answer our prayers if there is unforgiveness in our hearts. That's why it's so crucial that we have godly unity in our church so that no bitterness arises from any unforgiveness. We've been given, forgiven so much. We've been forgiven so completely by God. So what right do we have to withhold forgiveness from others who may offend us? We are all fallen people, so we all get it wrong sometimes. And we all need forgiveness as much as those that we come into contact with. Unforgiveness puts a barrier between us and God in terms of our fellowship with him. Not to mention the barrier that it puts between us and the person who we have not forgiven. That will never bring good fruit in our prayer life. And God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of others are inseparably linked. So we should never withhold forgiveness from those who hurt us or offend us. And we are more usually the losers rather than the unforgiven ones. So just to recap, Jesus came into Jerusalem exactly on time to fulfil what the Old Testament required as the one who is life and who alone can offer eternal life. The Jewish leaders had rejected him and were likened to a fig tree that bore no fruit because their religion had become lifeless, fruitless and insincere. 
The cursing of the fig tree, an Old Testament symbol of prosperity and flourishing of Israel at one point, now became a symbol of judgment and destruction. And these Jewish people were bitter and unforgiving, seeking to destroy Jesus. And we know from history that the nation suffered terribly because of that not many years later. But as Christians, we are told to have tender, loving hearts to God and to others. He looks for fruit in our lives as we live for him and serve him. God deserves our love, our adoration and worship. And others need to see God's love in action, to hear that God's message of salvation and enjoy the freedom of being forgiven and granted eternal life. So let's live it, live as God wants us to, as we serve him day by day. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for what we've seen tonight. Thank you for the, the glory of the, the uh, tri triumphal entry. Thank you that Jesus came exactly on time, presenting himself as the Messiah, as the King of Israel. And uh, well, thank you that he, he was welcomed in, in, in a sense as such, albeit shortly um, he would be put on the cross. Thank you for that parable of the, of the fig tree and what we can learn from that. And help us, Lord, to be authentic in our, in our faith. Help us not to just put on a show of religion, but to, to, to live our faith genuinely. Help us to, to live for you, to love you, to love our brothers and sisters, and to be the people you call us to be, so that the witness of the glory of the gospel can go out unhindered. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.